This is the realm of the rain clouds and the mountain gods. Here they are in a perpetual embrace. This is Sagamatha National Park in Nepal, home to the highest mountains in the world, Mount Everest. In Nepali, Sagamatha means where the ocean starts. Uh, Saga, the samundra. Samundra, eh? uh, Matha meaning uh, head. Although we are at 4,000 meters here, and it's the month of June, the temperature is cold as we explore the magnificent natural wonders around us. Although the nearest ocean is about a thousand miles away, no other name could be more appropriate for these mountains. These mountains are truly the beginning of our ocean. As the snow melts in the summer months and the rain clouds gather, the streams swell with huge volumes of water that run down from the Himalayas. As the water courses through the ravines and gullies, it picks up huge amounts of silt and sediment. The final destination of this runoff is the Bay of Bengal and the Indian Ocean. Through the lowlands of India and Bangladesh. Occasionally, this runoff as it rolls down can submerge huge areas of landmass, affecting millions of lives. The sediment rich water that courses through our land has formed the fertile lands of Bangladesh. Every year, Bangladesh receives nearly 1 billion tons of sediment from these mountains through hundreds of web-like rivers that crisscross the land. About 7% of the world's fresh water passes through the country into the ocean. This is the south-central coastal area of Bangladesh the final depository of all the sediments that the water carried down from the mountains. The mud is soft and treacherous here. <laughs> to the east of these mud flats is the longest unbroken beach of Cox's Bazaar. while to the west is the largest mangrove forest in the world, the Sundarbans, home to the Bengal tiger. While some sediment-rich waters drain through these areas as well, the highest amount of drainage is through the south-central coast and it is here where the largest deposits occur. This huge deposit of soft clay is always forming new land areas of Bangladesh. At low tide, the true extent of this deposit is visible. Many of the islands here are newly built by the sedimentation process and are transient in nature. Some will change their positions or disappear completely after the monsoon deluge. But for some, coastal reforestation has given this land a semi-permanent status. All of these semi-permanent islands are extremely fertile. 
and farmers here utilize this land to the fullest extent. Although only a few feet higher than sea level, almost any island more than 20 years old has a permanent human settlement of over 30,000. Some of the bigger islands have close to 100,000 inhabitants. These islands are not only attractive to humans, hundreds of other life forms have adapted to this environment. The bounty of the ocean and the land attracts a large number of wintering water birds, and some of these flocks may number in the thousands. These large flocks of birds may sometimes represent a significant percentage of the world's population of some species. These mud flats and sandy shores are some of the most important winter foraging grounds for such endangered birds as the spoon-billed sandpiper. Every year, Bangladeshi bird and nature lovers volunteer to survey and count these winter migrants amongst the coastal mud flats. Today, on the 7th of January 2004, we shall accompany them in such a mid-winter waterfowl survey. Our journey begins from the crowded city of Dhaka, the capital of Bangladesh, the most densely populated country in the world. Jadagat is the only freshwater port linking most of the southern districts with Dhaka and is one of the busiest points in the city. The river that services this port is a tributary of the mighty Ganges called the Buri Ganga. Yet once we clear the boundaries of this teeming megapolis of 15 million people, the rest of Bangladesh is a very different place. The hospitality of its impoverished rural people is genuine and unparalleled. The serenity of its riverine lands profound. Our motorised water transport glides gracefully through the meandering rivers towards the Bay of Bengal. We reach our destination in the early morning hours of the next day. This is the island of Bola, and our journey towards the bay begins here. A wooden planked fishing trawler is going to be our home and our transport for the next 10 days as we explore nearly 20 small islands along the coast. Although some of these islands are inhabited, most amenities are not available. We must make provisions for our daily needs prior to boarding the craft. Our travel plan will take us from Bola to the deep south, into Nijhum Deep, Char Shah Jalal, to Kukri Mukri, Char Dighai, and back to Bola again. Our first encounter with the mud is on the island of Dubar Char. This land formation is relatively new, therefore uninhabitable. Every day at high tide the whole island is submerged underwater and is covered by a fresh coat of silt.
When the water recedes at low tide again, numerous trapped fishes and crustaceans attract different bird species. Most of the birds that forage here are specialized feeders. Their bills are adapted to operating in soft mud. Once the bill is inserted in the mud, it acts as a probe for detecting hidden worms and fishes. Other birds, such as these egrets, will literally search for fishes with their toes. While mixed species of ducks feed along the soft, muddy shore, As some of the world's mightiest rivers running down from the Himalayas drain out into this coastline, it's here where the largest number of new island formations occur every year. The water along this coastline is permanently muddy due to the large volume of silt-laden fresh water. During the monsoon, when the water drainage is at its peak, this muddy coloration can extend a few miles out into the bay. Adjacent to Dubochar is Molovichar, another uninhabited island. A little older than Dubochar, this island does not submerge underwater at high tide. Therefore, the composition of flora and fauna is slightly different here than at Dubochar. Animals that do not like or cannot withstand complete submersion have made this their home, such as these fiddler crabs. Large number of birds like these Eurasian curlews come here to preen and rest at midday. while golden plovers feed throughout the grassy areas on the island. Numbers of different raptors hunt for prey amongst the smaller bird flocks. These grassy areas are also highly prized by cattle ranchers. Large herds of cattle are transported onto these islands during the dry winter months. Most of the animals are water buffaloes that are semi-feral in nature and with very short tempers. Yet some of the best quality milk and yogurt comes from these herds. Our migrant water bird survey on the first day of the census has produced an amazing total of approximately 10,000 individual birds of 25 species. It's a very good start after a hard day's work and we are ready to call it a day. Today we head for the island of Jahajmara. The fog and the shoals make navigation along these waters extremely difficult. While a large draft of a deep sea trawler can be a reassuring thing in the deep waters, here in the shallow waters it's a constant headache. At low tide it is virtually impossible to travel and grounding is a strong possibility.
Jahajmara has a permanent settlement of nearly 6,000 people who are solely dependent on fishing. During a good fishing season, each family may earn up to 15,000 taka or $250 for three months' work. While most men go out to the ocean, women help with the fish processing at home. Almost all of the catch is sold in advance to numerous middlemen or fishing vessel owners who make the real profit. The southern end of Jahajmara is one of the most important roosting areas for the critically endangered Indian skimmers. And if we are lucky today, we may come across their flock. Lady Luck smiles on us today. We have located our first skimmer flock. This is the largest colony of Indian skimmers in the world. But lack of undisturbed breeding areas elsewhere in the subcontinent has severely depleted their numbers. The skimmer colony here is estimated between 3 to 5,000 individual birds. Indian skimmers feed mainly at dawn or at dusk skimming the surface of the water for fish. Virtually no information is available on location of their nesting areas and breeding habits of these birds. A study should be undertaken to assess the future of these beautiful birds. Finding the skimmers is always a big event for the volunteers and we gather for an impromptu celebration in the knee-deep mud. Other birds also take advantage of the relative shelter provided by the coastal forest along the edge of this island, such as the bar-headed geese. Similar in size, these grey lag geese also use these coastal mudflats temporarily as their winter foraging ground. Unlike us, the birds have no problem getting access to the mudflats. To avoid being stranded at low tide, our main watercraft must be anchored in deeper waters. The only way to reach these shallow coastal areas is to use our small flat bottom boat. Sometimes the distance between our main boat and the shoreline may be more than a kilometre. But our boatman, Mr. Akhtar, never seems to run out of steam, even when the dinghy's bottom pans out. At the end of a day's mud walk, no matter how terrible the food might be from our cook, Mr. Pinto, today it tastes simply fantastic. Mm -hmm. 
from Jahaj Mara at the first light of dawn, we head for the island of Nijum Deep, or known to the locals as Baluchar, meaning Island of Sands. This is one of the farthest inhabited islands in the Bay of Bengal. We reach Nishum Deep around noon. Approximately 12,000 people, mostly fishermen, inhabit this island. A disproportionate number of small children seem to ply some of the trade gleefully, such as shrimp fry collection. while others are weighed down by monumental burden that seems so grossly unfair. Large flocks of coastal shorebirds feed along the sandy shores of Nijum Deep. These mixed flocks consist of pteric sandpipers, curlew sandpipers, lesser and greater sand plovers, stints, Kentish plovers, and ruddy turnstones. Ruddy turnstones have a particularly interesting feeding habit. In search of food, they constantly turn small stones over or anything that remotely resembles a stone to look for juicy grubs. These are some of the most widely travelled birds in the world and are found almost all across the globe during the migration period. Very often, the only protection the fishermen families can afford against the elements are thatched straw huts. The only tangible shelters against the tidal surges are the concrete structures that were built by the government after repeated large-scale loss of life. Perhaps with their own lives in constant peril, these people are reasonably tolerant of other life forms seeking refuge here, such as the collared doves amongst the fields. We replenish our fresh food stocks from a small market with its even smaller vendors. and then dock our trawler for the night. Today, after some morning workout and charting our course, we head towards the island of Cha Shah Jalal, leaving the beautiful island of Nijum Deep and its hospitable people behind. The company of whiskered terns looking for an easy meal at the rear of our boat is enough to break the monotony of an otherwise dull ride.
If we do not get stranded on the way, it should take us no more than five hours to reach our destination. At midday, we reached Char Shah Jalal, a bleak, isolated island with a few inhabitants, making this the perfect habitat for wildlife that can reach here. This island is mostly sandy with some fine clay. A creeper such as Ipomia prescapra has already gained a good foothold here. A significant area is covered by a hardy strain of tall grass, giving protection to birds such as these black-headed ibis. Their long bill is a perfect tool for operating along these mudflats. These birds are found only along our coastal wetlands and are the main breeding residents of this area. At low tide, the shallow estuary provides a good feeding and roosting ground for a large number of ducks. The shovelers, the gadwalls and the pintails. But the biggest attraction of this island is the common shell duck. This relatively undisturbed island is the main wintering ground for thousands of these beautiful birds arriving from Central Asia or even further. It is quite perplexing as to how this bleak landscape can support such a huge concentration of large birds for almost four months, until you observe their feeding habits. These ducks are gleaners and they glean on the muddy surface for food. The shallow water depth and the water clarity, combined with uninterrupted sunshine, produces a vast amount of algae on the surface of the soft mud. At low tide, when the water recedes, exposing the huge food supplies, these ducks follow the receding water line. But their food supply is equally abundant at high tide and the process is equally interesting. As the water recedes, exposing a vast expanse of landmass, the algae is exposed to the sun, causing it to dry up slightly, thus becoming lighter. When the water returns at high tide, the lighter algae floats to the surface. The tide can be fast and furious, carrying everything in its way. Even the numerous small insects that come to feed on the exposed grasses are swept up by the tide. The water can rise almost an inch per minute. This floating line of algae can stretch for miles around and the ducks converge in large numbers to gorge on this easy harvest every day. Once the feeding is done for the day, they rest in the sheltered lagoon, often rocked by a gentle ocean breeze.
We plan to be with the ducks tonight and set anchor amongst this vast wilderness. Soon the night sky brightens up with a full moon, casting a long shadow on the lapping waters of the Bay of Bengal. Illuminating a distant fisherman, perhaps on his homeward journey. Enveloped by a light layer of fog, the island takes on a mysterious, seductive look at daybreak. Some of us come ashore to explore the magic of this enchanted island. At sunrise, our crew prepares the boat for the journey onward. Today, we will go to the very end of this island and turn back. This would be the farthest we go into the bay on this trip. The southern end of this island is completely sandy, and walking here is a pleasant experience, unlike some of the earlier islands that we left behind. We find our first casualty here, a juvenile large egret that we are able to rescue and let go. আমরা <laughs> <laughs> At midday, we head for the island of Dalchor and reach there towards late evening. Many of the deep sea fishing trawlers come here for the relative safety of this community bazaar at night and also to buy fuel for their boats. Perhaps a good shave would not be a bad thing in this bazaar after almost a week's wanderings. We hope to explore the northern part of Dalchor this morning. Although the human settlement and activity is relatively vibrant, there is a mutual respect for most living things. And the mud skippers are free to wage their own wars without human intervention. Most fishermen here know how to utilize the tidal variation of water levels and use it to their own advantage by setting up trap nets at high tide. While the fishermen are busy setting up the nets, the birds take it easy by resting nearby, hoping for a brighter future also.
As the water recedes at low tide, exposing the nets, only the fish need to be collected. The birds also descend upon this bounty and are rewarded for their patience without much resistance from the fishermen. And they gather there daily by the hundreds. Although rewarding this method of fish harvesting with such a fine mesh net is extremely counterproductive to the overall wild fish regeneration, as this method of fish harvesting destroys a massive number of small fish fry. Most often the birds themselves are quite capable of locating a catch and exploiting it without its human counterpart. Leaving Dalchor behind, we now approach the island of Fulpur. Already we have travelled quite a way inland, leaving the sea behind. This is the Titulia River Channel. Water along this stretch of the river is fresh. The bird species have also started to change, reflecting the difference in water conditions. Birds that prefer fresh water are more common here, such as these ruddy shell ducks. More of an inland duck, they are found throughout our river system during the winter migration period. They feed mostly on vegetative matter. Preening is an extremely important part of the bird's natural behaviour. It helps to restore the depleted oils on the feathers that keep it water resistant. These ducks migrate all the way from Ladakh in India, a distance of about 2,000 miles. They are extensively hunted throughout our river system during the migration period. And as a result, their numbers have severely declined in recent years. It is a real possibility that this duck may disappear from our river system soon. Other wildlife that used to be resident in our river system have disappeared recently, such as this once common river tern. Hunters from larger cities still come to hunt along these river channels and shoot anything that moves, such as egrets, sandpipers, or ducks. Hilsha, once a common fish of our river system, harvested in thousands of tons in the past, now has dwindled to a mere fraction of the previous amount, pushing these fishermen further into poverty. A recent comparison of annual catch data of this common fish reveals a steep decline. In 1995, the total catch was nearly 14,000 metric tons. 
while in 2002, the catch amount had dropped to a mere 2,000 metric tons, a drop of almost 80% in a span of only eight years. <music> Creating sanctuaries for wildlife and the protection of spawning grounds for our fishes may still help to restore these valuable resources, but in order to achieve this, people must be trained and deployed to protect these assets. This is the last day of our exploration and survey. It was an extremely rewarding week, and today we must head back to the island of Bola to catch our transport back to Dhaka. As we gather to tally the final count of this survey, we realize that this trip was an outstanding success in every way. We have gained tremendous appreciation and understanding of our magnificent natural world. And the numbers, when put into world context, will give us a clearer picture as to how these birds are really faring in an increasingly hostile world. Virtually every living thing in this planet is being affected by our actions today, and we must be their custodians if these beautiful animals are to survive for the next generations. All these creatures have managed to survive without assistance for millions of years, but now many species are in dire peril because of us. And we must take responsibility for their demise. Our future also depends on the survival of these endangered species. If the mountain is the mother to our ocean, then the rivers that connect the mountain to the ocean is a mother to us all. It has provided us with all our needs for millennia and may provide for countless generations more, but only if we are kind to her in return as she flows from the mountains to the mudflats. <laughs> Hey, I'm not going to